Hello, I'm Carrie Clymer. I'm with Elgin Burke's Assembly of God, and this is the online Sunday school class. This is Sunday morning's uh, lesson. We're starting it on Sunday night. Uh, pardon me, on Saturday night. We're very happy to have you with us this evening, and we trust you get to be with us in service tomorrow. Uh, but you have a home church. We certainly uh, do not expect you to leave to come to ours. As I alluded to last week, we have started a remodeling project here at our house, and you see that some more of it has been completed. Uh, well, actually, maybe you can't see, but anyway, that we have the floor is now in. We don't have the ceiling, obviously, ready, but just so you'll know, that is what's going on around here. The title of our lesson is The Messiah Comes. We have started our second half, our second unit in our quarterly and we're looking forward to studying this especially today about the Messiah. Remember we've studied all along and if you follow with us in the Old Testament studies we had in the first unit and the promised Messiah, the Messiah was coming, the hope that we had. See you had to be bringing all these sacrifices and you had the law to try to live according to that and you just, it was just more than you could do yet it, it helped you to understand we needed a savior. You try as you may, you couldn't keep all of the law. It, and that wasn't to condemn you, it was to show you that you needed a savior and to, there were so many different prophets that the Lord sent through all of these years and the promise of a Messiah, of the savior to come. And now we embark on this, in this lesson of how the Messiah did come. And thank the Lord we know that for those of us who love the Lord and know Him and serve Him, we recognize and are so thankful for this. It's good to see Harmony on tonight. The Lord bless you, Harmony. Glad to hear, have you listening and watching tonight. So let's go to our key verse is Matthew 1 and 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And that is from the King James Version. And let's go to the New Amer uh, International Version. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Our central truth, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save us from sin. Oh, how thankful we are. It's so good to be able to serve him every single day, to have not just an encounter with him, but a living, vital relationship with him. So after our journey through the highlights of the Old Testament and the way they're doing the quarterly this time, is it's a wide swaths of the Word of God that you're uh, leading you through it. It's a, a high, it's the highlights of that. In that case, was the Old Testament, and now into the New Testament. Here we are going. You know, uh, when the Savior was promised, it makes us think about something that's promised many, many years in advance, and. We can say, for us personally, each person can attest to the fact your best laid plans will sometimes just fall apart. You've done everything you know to do. You've planned it exactly perfectly. You think nothing can go wrong, and it does. But look at what, when God does something, when he promises something, his plans are intact. They will, he doesn't have to send out uh, a revision. Uh, we're sorry, this has happened. Something unforeseen has happened. You can't fool God. He knows in advance. He's all-knowing. So we're so thankful that that is the case, that he didn't have to send out a retraction, that it's not going to happen. The Messiah won't come. The Messiah did come. So when we go to the beginning in, in Matthew of how, how it was announced and how the, we saw where Jesus did come, the Gospel of Matthew begins with the revelation of how God miraculously fulfilled that prophecy and how that, how that Mary was the mother of Jesus who was called the Messiah and then focused on the confirmation of this reality to Joseph. You think of what it was like for Mary that when the angel spoke to her that she was to be the mother of the Christ child. This was, they tell us, that possibly these young girls, all they knew of the prophecy and they would pray that they could be the mother of Jesus. Perhaps she was one of those girls, but she was totally 
devoted and yielded to the Lord and willing. But she wondered, how can this be? I'm not married. She was engaged to somebody, but she was not married. And so but the Lord spoke to her and let her know that it was of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, she would be with child. But, but when what was it like? She was going to have to tell Joseph. He was going to think she had been unfaithful. How could she ever convince him that, it, that the, an angel had spoken to her and that it was of the Lord that the Holy Spirit would come and she was with child? But you know, in some cases, you worry like this and then you find out they already had, had known, had found out, and knew. And in this case, an angel had actually appeared to Joseph when he had found out even before Mary could tell him, he had word it was out that she was with child. He had to make a decision. He loved her. He was engaged to her. It, it was even stronger like than, than our engagement. He was making plans. He was probably building a house, getting ready for to take his wife. And now he finds out, he wondered, what will I do? But he didn't have to worry. He, what will I do? His plan. The Lord told him, it's all right. She has not been unfaithful to you, but this is of the Holy Ghost. She is going to bear the Christ child and said to him, the same as to her, his name will be Jesus or Emmanuel, God with us. So Jesus grew up. It's important that we know he grew up in a righteous family. Joseph and Mary were devoted to the Lord. They, they were devoted to Judaism and to do that was pleasing and, and following the law as the best that they could. And so they begin to teach and to train this child. Now there are those, some people that do believe that you should just let a child just grow up and let them decide when they grow up what they want to be. And that is a terrible thing. Never does uh, the Lord tell us that in the scriptures. It was always teaching and in the, in the law. You were to teach and to train your children. And in fact, it said when you were walking, it said when you were in the, it was whether it was morning, evening, night, night or noon, whatever you were doing, you were to be teaching and training your children. That it was a, a parental responsibility. They took that very seriously. So Mary displayed a true righteousness in that she joyfully accepted the mission of bearing the Christ child. And now that he was born and they were teaching and training him, well, the day came when he was 12 years old. And the way they did in that time and still carries on today is called Bar Mitzvah. When you were 12 years old, well, here, this was, the, it was a special time. They became a son of the covenant. And so they honored that. His approval by the Jewish religious leadership would mark an important transition in his life. Well, as the caravan of pilgrims, including Mary and Joseph, left Jerusalem to return home, they had gone uh, to, for this occasion, as they went to return home, and is it, uh, we don't know if Mary thought he was with Joseph and Joseph thought he was with her because the way they traveled in our lesson, I, I found out something I, I had not known is that the way they did this in New Testament times, the women and children traveled in one group while the men and the older boys traveled in another group. So it's possible that she thought he was with Joseph. Joseph thought he was with Mary. And it turned out, unknown to them, he was, he was at the temple. He already knew. He had already sensed and knew. He had this, that he was supposed to be teaching and training or learning and growing and showing a, more of, of the, well, there was just something about him, shall we say, the best way. He just, he was already drawn. He was already understood. Though he may not have known everything, he did, he had such insights. He was so attuned to the Lord. He seen his parents say, well, he was the son of God, but he'd emptied himself of that. Here he was coming as a, just a, a baby born here to walk as a man among the people that he could know and understand what we went through. So when Mary and Joseph began to look for him, they had been gone a day and they went back as soon as they realized he was gone, it had been a whole day's journey, they went back, and it took them three days to find him. Imagine, here he was in the temple. So one person brought out, and I like to think about this, the seriousness of this, it took one day 
to lose him, but three days to find him. And I thought, you know, in life sometimes if we miss the mark and we think we just want to try something for a while, we'll be right back. We want to serve the Lord, but right now we want to depart and do something. And I'll be right back. Sometimes it takes much longer to find our way back. So we want to make sure that we just stay tuned in to the Lord at all times. That's the best thing to do. So loving the Lord, loving his Father, his Heavenly Father, seeing the example that they did, that they were reaching, always reaching out to God. They went through the law, the best that they could do to honor the Lord. It's important that we have, that we're faithful in our attendance, and his parents were great example. And it's still a great example today. And so in his earthly ministry, we go to Jesus' earthly ministry. He was baptized and anointed for the ministry. But before Jesus was born, God had a plan for him to be introduced to the people of Israel as the promised Messiah. And God did another miracle. He gave the childless couple, Zechariah, who was the priest, the chief priest, and Elizabeth, his wife, a son in their old age, and he was instructed by the Lord. The child's name was to be John the Baptist. He would prepare the way for the Messiah and introduce him to Israel. What a wonderful thing for his ministry. He had somebody went ahead of him. Now, he he really didn't look the part, maybe. He dressed strangely. He, he was just different, and uh, he seemed to enjoy being out. He was like he was truly an outdoorsman. John the Baptist, a cousin of Jesus, he had a prophetic ministry that included the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And his message challenged believers to repent and turn from their sinful ways. Jesus was baptized with John to align himself with the people he had come to save. Now, Jesus' baptism was not the result of personal forgiveness that he needed because he was sinless. Luke's account of the baptism of Jesus indicates that the baptism of others preceded that of Jesus. That while Jesus was praying, that a supernatural revelation of God occurred as he prayed. The heavens opened, the scripture says. The heavens opened, the Holy Spirit descended as a dove, and the voice of the Father affirmed Jesus as the Son of God. Think of that. The anointing of the Holy Spirit, symbolized by a dove, identified Jesus as the one who saves people from their sins. Thus, in this setting, the three persons of the Godhead, the Trinity, uh, the, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, are clearly seen. Well, from this Jordan baptism, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for a time of testing. Uh, Satan himself would come to test him. And the anointing of the, of the Spirit sustained him through this and enabled him. for He had endured during his, it was a 40-day fast, and enabled him to gain a victory over the devil there. He was, he had prepared himself. He didn't know what all was coming, but he was prayed. It's so important that we have daily prayer, and that time of reading God's Word, and not just reading it, but applying it to our hearts, and knowing that God is preparing us as we read it for whatever our day holds. So the Lord can help us to be faithful it was he was regularly participating and honoring the Lord. It wasn't just hit and miss. There was people that that knew him. They probably looked at him. They didn't realize. I don't think he, at this time, he was any different, appeared any different. That people, rec they didn't recognize that he was the son of God. He had not actually been that was not known at this time. He just appeared probably just like any other Jewish boy, but the Lord was preparing him. Authority was to heal and forgive was given to him. Jesus declared his authority to those around him and also demonstrated that authority in his ministry. In fact, when he went to, to a, a Capernaum, a village on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee in the home of several of his disciples, including Peter, Peter as he was... Uh, as was his custom on the Sabbath. I love this. As was the Bible says, as was his custom. He was in the synagogue teaching with authority. He wasn't just saying, I'm not sure, and I think maybe. He was speaking with such authority. There was an anointing, and people recognized there was something different. Jesus' teaching flowed with such this anointing that it, the people realized the authority, and they paid attention to it. 
the, the authority of Jesus by t was tested on that Sabbath day by a demoniac, somebody that had a, had this demonic spirits, and they called out and recognized that Jesus, who Jesus was, that he was, and without hesitation, he demonstrated his authority, and he delivered that man from those demon spirits. They were cast out of him. He was set free from that. What a tremendous thing for these people to see the authority that he had over even the demons that they had to leave this man. This man was, he was left, he was made whole. When the demons were gone, he was, he was made whole and well. And the anointing of the Holy Spirit was regularly nurtured by Jesus through times of withdrawal. Even time there was scripture would tell us he would leave, he would go aside. He was praying, he was calling out to the Father. And he, by then, he seen, he was sensed and knew who he was and what his call was and that what he was the savior of the world. What a tremendous thing. And he gave himself to that, knowing that he came, he was going to have to die on the cross someday. He didn't run from that. He didn't hide. He was out publicly. And here he is ministering. But the people that, uh, the Pharisees that were responsible, uh, the for the, they, these people were they were the ones they were the leaders in the, the church they were the the ones that were supposed to be teaching the law and, and be recognizing that Jesus was the Messiah instead they had become just uh, so legalistic and they had added things to this the law and almost pretty much just made their own laws whatever they wanted to do and follow them but there was one that when Jesus was he was being introduced, his ministry was being introduced. There was a time that he, there was a paralyzed man's friends. They had faith in the authority of Jesus. They had seen what God was doing, how he was using him. The Father was using him. And these people were being healed. Well, there were some people who had a friend they wanted to bring because he was paralyzed and he couldn't get to Jesus. And when they finally was able to get to him. They actually had to take the roof off of the house because there was such a crowd. They couldn't get him in, into Jesus. So what they did, they just went up on the roof and they actually uh, took the roof apart to a portion of it so they could get this man down in there, lowered him down uh, on a mat that they had lowered him down. And when Jesus said to this man that your sins be forgiven you, and I mean the Pharisees said, who he can't forgive sins? Why? This man is false. He's, uh, well, it said only God can forgive sins, not this man. But he was the son of God. He could forgive sins. And he healed that man. And they anger, it angered them. And here you are saying, and said that you're healing here on, that was on the Sabbath day. They thought that was awful. And for you to say that you can forgive sins. And he said, it's just as easy for me to say that he's, he could do it. He had the authority to do it, to forgive sins and the authority to heal. And he demonstrated that that day. Oh, what a great display. What authority, authority Jesus displayed. So many of the people, what would be called the common people, responded in faith to him and they followed him. Huge crowds followed. Of course, this upset the, the Pharisees. And they were very angry about that and tried to downplay it, that he was nobody, he was a nothing, you should just resist him. But no, the more they told him that, the more they accepted him because they saw he truly loved them. He wasn't just doing things to get a crowd. He loved them. He had such compassion for them, the many healings and the things that he did in helping the people any way that he could. But before it was over with, they did get him. Yes, they did get him, but it was because he was willing to go. He could have called, as he indicated, and he knew, he could have called 10,000 angels or more to have come and protected him and come and delivered him, but he chose to be willing to do the Father's will, and that was to go to the cross, die on the cross for our sins, and he, he died a horrible death. It wasn't quick and easy. No, it was an awful death. A crucifixion sometimes took days, but in this case, it, he did not. It did not. But it wasn't only the crucifixion. It was a horrible trial that was so unfair. And there, with with Pilate saying, "I don't. This man is not guilty. I, there's no. He's not guilty of anything." 
and they kept crying out, crucify him, crucify him. He wasn't a strong leader. He wanted to be popular with these people. He didn't want them to report him, and he couldn't remain as the leader. So he gave in to it, and he said, okay, you, you take him, but I don't find any fault with him. But he was a really, really, as I said, a very weak leader. So Jesus was taken and died uh, this a horrible death. And it, sometimes it took days, but not in Jesus' case. Jesus, when he's on the cross, when he said, he said, it is finished. He had done everything the Father had called him, him to do. And he said, it is finished. And into thy, in your hand, he said, I, I just commit myself to the, the Father. He had done his will, and he bowed his head and died. But he did not stay dead. We know that he did. Now, there was rejoicing among the Pharisees. There was rejoicing among the chief priests. There was great rejoicing. We've killed him. He's just a deceiver. He said he was the son of God. He's not the son of God. But then, remember how that he was he rose from the dead. And here came Mary Magdalene, who had been one of his converts, one of those who had, had been so sinful that she had been set free. Here she is now. As, as she gets, she goes to, the, they had taken him. He had been buried. Jesus had been buried. Where usually people, the what they call the criminals that were, were hanged, they were just thrown out. I mean, they didn't have any use for them. They didn't have any kind of a decent burial. But remember how that Mary and, to, and there was others that had gone and they had taken the body of Jesus and they had lovingly, carefully prepared his body for burial. And then a, he'd been placed in a tomb. This gentleman had, uh, had offered his tomb and there he was buried in that tomb. But then when they went to go and to anoint his body out later to do that, he the the tomb that had been sealed, it was open. And Jesus, when he appeared to them before he went to be back up to go to be with the Father, he appeared to them and let them know and showed them and they saw his the scar this uh, nails that saw the nail the scars of the nails in his hand. He showed them he really was the Son of God. And they, again, it was just reinforced when they had thought, oh, he died, it's over. He had already told him what was going to happen, that he would rise again. Somehow they didn't get it. I guess it was so impossible to believe, to accept such a thing. But it was true. And yes, Jesus did rise from the dead. And here he is, then when he appeared, when he had appeared to them, how it was, it was amazing. Not only could he heal, could he set people free from uh, like the, the demons, but he cleansed the sin, and he was he had he couldn't be killed and stay dead. He had he arose victorious, as we say, over death, hell, and the grave. So the Lord gives us this wonderful account, touches our hearts, and thrills us to know that it isn't just for them; it is for us. All those who will love the Lord and serve him, we will someday get to live with him forever and ever. But in the meantime, we get to live for him now and serve him and tell others about him. In spite of the sin of Adam and Eve, the frailty of the patriarchs and the rebellion of Israel that we studied about in our previous lessons, God never gave up on humanity. I love this. He never gave up on humanity and said, you're just so sinful, it's just, I I just wish I had never created you. I'm just going to do away with everybody and never have anybody ever again. People, he never said that. People, I wish I'd never created them. But he longs for our love, for our fellowship, and that relationship with him. And he wants us to be with him in heaven, in the glory world, and oh, can we sing like this? Think of the song that says, Oh, I want to see him. Oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. Oh, his mercy be extended to us. We should be so totally bound to him in love and faith and faithfulness and just an appreciation. Oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face, the one who saved me 
by his grace and be able to worship him forever and ever and live in that kingdom of God where there's no sin can ever get into that place. There's no need, there's no times of sorrow and grieving. I don't know what all will be happening there, but we will be busy. We'll be serving the Lord, working for him. It's going to be the greatest place. And sometimes people say they hate it because they're going through all kinds of things here. But like I told a friend of mine just recently, I said, if we had everything easy and everything was just wonderful, we wouldn't even think about leaving here. But we have these problems and issues and things that come up, and we're thinking, you know, I do look forward to the day that we can go where there is no sin, that we don't have to deal with our own carnality and having to keep us you know, doing the right thing. But I'm thankful he's always there to help us. Help us. I'm so thankful that our relationship with him can be restored. If it is broken, can be restored. So relationship with him, even as we anticipate our eternal home that he is now preparing for us, may we ever be faithful and dedicated, holy, consecrated to him. May the Lord bless you and keep you until next Sunday we will be back. So it'll be this time I'm getting, usually it's after midnight, but I made it earlier this time. So you be blessed until next time. Good evening.